Okay, I think we should start. So let us all welcome Professor Dheeraj Bhatia from Biological Engineering Discipline of Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Gandhinagar. We are very happy that he has agreed to give this talk on doing carpentry with DNA. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sudipto. And uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, I'm sure last uh, we all enjoyed the first talk which uh, Sudipto presented on the black holes, uh, the evolution and dynamics of that. And if you recall just a little bit of those slides, uh, the distances which Sudipto was talking about, the death of the stars and the black holes, they were huge distances, like which you cannot measure in kilometers, like you need light years or parsec kind of scales. And also, we cannot see most of those events through eyes. Like you need giant telescopes to capture those images and analyze the data. And what I will do today is I will take you all on a journey in the opposite dimensions, where we are going to see the molecules and phenomenon happening at the nanoscale, or we can say at the atomistic scales, uh, where we are seeing how the molecules are arranging at nanometer scale and then they influence many of the physiological properties of the life and we understand how we can use those physiological properties to come up with some diagnostic tools or better tools for the healthcare and one of the focuses uh, which my lab and uh, the general field of dna nanotechnology has is uh, using the molecule of the life the genetic material of the life the dna deoxyribonucleic acids which is just two nanometers in the thickness and then it can go the in the lens it can go up to the meters so the general topic of my talk today is doing carpentry with the dna that how we can play with the molecule of the life and i'll begin with how we can make different designs at the nanoscale using the dna and then i'll focus a little bit on the applications of this very emerging technology that can we come up with some diagnostic tools for many, many diseases, including the one which is currently ongoing, the COVID-19 pandemic, that can we come up with some therapeutics for the coronavirus tracking and stopping it. So let me begin with a general introduction. Uh, I guess even so, Dipto slightly touched on this and I would play uh, discuss a bit more on that, that everything in nature still resembles. Like if you take any system, whether it is a cell, a simple device like this mobile phone or a laptop or the infrastructures, the buildings, uh, including the arrangements of the planets in the solar system, arrangements of the solar systems in the galaxies, an arrangement of the galaxies in the universe, everything, every system uh, self assembles based on the components, based on the energy, based on the environment, and then those systems um, are in their own equilibriums. And if you look at the biology, the human body, or the components from which we are ma made, the most interesting examples which we see are uh, also intent to the biological macromolecules. And out of all the biological macromolecules, like the proteins, the DNA, RNA, sugars, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids and proteins have been very, very more focused areas of the research because their structures or their surfaces encode something called as the information. That there's information which is embedded in their structures and which leads to the functions of them in the life. Now, being in the biological engineering department or being in the Institute of Technology, we always try to seek in opportunities that we screen uh, from a biological point of view. We screen the nature for the functions and we adapt and can we repurpose some of those functions. And the main motive for doing this, what if you need a new function, okay. not in the nature? Hello? Uh, there is some noise. Can, can, uh, can, can you switch on the, uh, the mic? Can you safe and healthy heaven for birds as well? Uh, is it okay now? Should I continue? So, yeah. yeah, I think everybody has switched off their mic. Oh, oh, thank, thank you. So the main goal, why we are exploring different biomolecules is what if there is a need of a new function not yet found in the nature? For example, at this moment, like none of us are immune to the coronavirus. And can we come up with some property by which we can develop a new property in the existing structures to adapt to the changes? For example, I'll show you two simple examples that we all know from our 10th standard biology that DNA is the genetic material, 
and from DNA comes the RNA and from RNA comes the proteins. What if we can reverse this process? That can I take now the protein and make the process reverse? That from protein I make RNA, from RNA can I make DNA? Or can I make protein as a Xerox machine? That I don't need DNA to make multiple copies of the protein. Can I just take a protein and put some molecules so that this protein can now act as a Xerox copy and it can start multiplying or making multi of its copies? So these are some of the examples which we can uh, ask using the natural systems or one of the recent examples is that can we trap the coronavirus at this moment like the biggest challenge before the humanity at this moment is to come up with a vaccine now most of the vaccines against the viruses are based on the proteins the antibiotics or the small drugs which can target the specific components of those viruses by the time those researches are happening because the human trials of antibody based vaccines or small molecule based vaccines take a lot of time can we come up with some artificial system which can like grab the virus or just catch it and trap it in its structure and degrade it and throw it off some kind of technologies if we can develop using the naturally occurring biomolecules that would be something cool and this gives us the idea that now you have different biomolecules for example proteins dna carbohydrates can we specify the functions to those biomolecules and build them from the scratch? I'm sure many of you must have seen this news article where Chinese people developed something called as designer babies. That they can put the genes of their own choice into the baby when it is in, still in the embryonic stage. And then the baby comes up with the one particular color of the eyes, different body strength, number of teeth and bones and etc. And so that's the ideal goal of the biological engineering that can we specify function and build it from the scratch but the reality is the mankind cannot do it like even though we have advanced technologies in dna sequencing dna structure protein engineering we still are far far away from engineering the nat nature or the natural occurring systems but what we can do is we realize the custom functions which are existing in the synthetic molecular complexes and integrate these functions into the higher order systems which we can make in the laboratories and apply these systems in science to understand how biomolecules work in technology and in health and over the next half an hour i'm going to touch little bit in each of these areas using one particular molecule that is a dna now before i go into the dna let's have a small comparison that when i started my talk with the uh, the sentence that out of all the biomolecules, proteins and DNA are very, very specific because both of them encode information in their sequences. Like proteins are made from the amino acids and they have very, very specific functions which is written in their code, in their amino acid sequences. Same goes for the DNA. But why to choose DNA and not the proteins? So let's look quickly have, uh, uh, have a look at the proteins. So proteins are the long strings of the amino acids it's just like a small thread, a thread which is made up from the amino acids. And these threads can be folded into 3D shapes called as the tertiary structures. Now, they can exist in multiples of those 3D structures, but we still do not know how to predict or design the tertiary structures very well for a proteins. For example, if I give you a sequence of the amino acid, a thread of the amino acid, and if I ask you to fold it into one particular structure, we still don't know how to do it. And these tertiary structures then later on assemble to form the complex quaternary structures. So these are like some of the examples like the bacterial toxins or the viruses. Because viruses also use very, very simple. This is a trimeric motif of the DNA of the protein, which can polymerize or self-assemble into the full viral capsid. But we still do not know how to predict or design the quaternary structures very well of those proteins. And hence, like can we ask something to DNA that can DNA do something similar and the answer is yes that make playing Lego or playing games with DNA is much much more easier and engineering DNA is much more easier than the proteins now why the answer lies in its own structure if you see DNA it is a simple duplex a double helical structure a polymer of the nucleotides so this is one single strand of the DNA which is the red and the another strand is complementary to it and DNA, the structure is made from the four bases or nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which can very, very specifically self-assemble with each other using the Watson-Crick base pairing. There are only two rules which 
we need to follow when we are doing the self assembly of the DNA that A forms base pairs with T and G forms base pair with C. So, four molecules, two rules, and then you can do unlimited structures out of the DNA. So, the base pairing, which I just said, the Watson Creek base pairing acts as a molecular glue or a molecular signature. So, for example, this is a simple cartoonistic impression of a duplex DNA. You can see one single strand of DNA where different molecules or different nucleotides can very, very specifically form Watson Creek base pairing with the other complementary sequence. Now, you can visualize this strand as a cylinder because if you remember from my back slide, the DNA is not linear. So, the polymer is twisted. It is exactly like how those Maggi noodles, which we eat at our homes. So Maggi noodles, if you see, they're helically turned. Same is the structure for the DNA, a B DNA structure. And if you look at it from the top, you can see that it's kind of a cylinder. So we can visualize duplex DNA as a cylinder. And just remember one thing, that every polymer has something called as persistence length. It, it is a length up to which the polymer can act as a rigid rod. In case of duplex DNA or double stranded DNA, this persistence length is 50 nanometers or 150 nucleotides, which means that up to the distances of 50 nanometers, my duplex DNA can act as a rigid rod. Now let's play around with it. Suppose I modify one of the strand of the DNA and I include some more single stranded bases. And now I want it to self assemble it another strand. And if I put it in a test tube, which has different nucleotides like say hundreds or thousands of them what will happen is that only the sequence which has 100 percent complementarity with this sequence will go and form the watson creek base pair and you can arrange two duplexes in a fashion which you want and this field which uses dna as a building material is called as structural dna nanotechnology now if you look at the properties of the dna there are three properties one it is simple in structure you can easily synthesize DNA using the solid phase synthesis and you can get multiple strands at a very very cheap cost it is robust and you have softwares by which you can make the designs to program the structures of those DNA right so let's have a small example I will take four strands of the DNA A, B, A prime and B prime in such a way that this part of the green is complementary to this A blue is complementary to this green yellow is complementary to this green and Importantly, this part of the A is complementary to this part of the A prime and B is complementary to B prime. Now, when I take four strands of these, put them in a test tube, just heat it up and slowly cool them so that these strands self-assemble, what will happen is that they will not stop at this, but they will start to self-assemble into two-dimensional sheets. And these you can visualize using the microscope called as atomic force microscope or electron microscope. And you can see very, very beautiful two-dimensional architectures made from the DNA. These are all at the nanometer scale, so we cannot see by the eyes. You need very high powerful microscopes like the electron microscope or the AFM to see these structures. Now, let me take you quickly to some of the examples. That if you take a one-dimensional wire, like if you want to assemble a 1D wire or a tube, you can easily make them using different motifs. For example, this is a three-way junction, a, just a stand, uh, a complex, which is made from the three primers in which only two are complementary to each other. And if I mix them in a test tube and I heat them, what will happen is they will start to self-assemble into the zigzag puzzle like thing. And you can put gold nanoparticles as a probe to see this railway track kind of thing forming uh, uh, using the electron microscope. So these are 1D nanowires or nanotubes, which you can make using DNA devices. Or you can modify, you can make the designs in 2D that instead of three strands, you can take four strands or five strands and then make these structures complementary to these ones and they will start to self-assemble in test tube to form two-dimensional sheets or two-dimensional nanocrystals. But the biggest... Thiraj. Yes. Uh, uh, pro earlier, I saw your presentation. Now that has gone uh, and your uh, video is focused. Can you please... Okay. I, I just I will stop sharing and once again I'll start sharing. Okay, just give me yeah. one second, please. Is it okay now? Yeah, it is coming. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, yeah. The the biggest focus 
on the DNA nanotechnology. So I was mentioning in my two slides before that you can bend the DNA into either one dimensional nanowires or nanotubes, or you can make two dimensional arrays or the crystals, or the biggest fascination which came was you can those DNA arms or junctions into 3D to make different kinds of those three dimensional nano cages or the polyhedra. And this has been one of the very, very big focus of the field of DNA nanotechnology. And I will answer it in a few minutes. Why are we interested in this polyhedra? And can we use them to trap the viruses and put them or target them for the degradation, right? So let me show you one simple example of how do we make a DNA mimic of the virus? Now, this is something which my lab, uh, my students make every day in the laboratory at IIT Gandhinagar. So let's visualize a virus. Now, a typical virus, uh, is kind of an icosahedral in geometry, which is like this. And what you can do is you can label the, the vertices of the virus or an icosahedron. Let's for simplicity label the top vertex and the bottom vertex as the V. And the ring of upper 5A junctions or the vertices as U and the ring of lower vertices as N. Now, if you give any molecule to a chemist and ask him to synthesize, what a chemist will do is it will he or she will break the molecule into small modules. He will synthesize those modules and then self-assemble to get a bigger molecule. This is called as retrosynthesis. So let's do the same kind of retrosynthesis with the DNA. Assume that I want to make this virus-like structure or an icosahedron out of the DNA. What I will do is I will cut it in the middle. I will cut this and what I will see is that it is made from two cup-shaped structures. The upper cup, let's again label this as a V and U5 which is this and the lower one VL5, okay? And the only trick I will do is that in this upper half, I will label the single standard DNA in such a way that this pink is exactly same as this one so that they will not self-assemble, they will not attach to each other, but this pink is complementary to this pink so that when I take these two cups and I mix them in one is to one stoichiometry in a test tube, I can make the full virus. Now, Look at this VU5 from the top, okay? Or look at this VL5 from the bottom. What you see is that this is made from a single vertex, which is the central vertex over here, in such a way that all the single standard overhangs are identical to each other so that they will not self-assemble. Now I add another 5 way junction in such a way that only one orange is complementary to this orange and this light green is complementary to dark green. Now, if I mix this in 1 is to 5 ratio, what will happen is they will self-assemble in this VU5 uh, kind of manner in a stoichiometry. And then when you join these open ends using a small molecule or an enzyme called its ligase, these open ends will start to stitch to each other. And the moment these arms start coming close to each other, it will put a kind of a pressure or a torque on the central vertex so that it will pop out of the plane and it will adopt this cup-shaped geometry, right? And using this, a simple engineering approach, you can take five pieces of the DNA, which you can easily uh, uh, purchase from the com company, or you can synthesize in your own lab, and you can make a virus using just 10 or 15 strands of the DNA. So this is one of the magic of the DNA, the robustness in the design. And using this strategy, you can make many, many kinds of architectures. You can make platonic solids, Archimedean solids, many, many ways. And one more approach, which is this DNA origami, now, I'm sure all of us must have seen our grandmothers or at least our parents that they take a woolen cloth or sorry, a woolen um, thread, two needles, and they start to weave a th uh, the, the thread using those uh, two um, nails and they create a sweater or something like those, right? How about doing the same with the DNA? And this technology, which was developed in 2005, is called DNA origami, in which what we can do is we can take a naturally occurring long single strand of DNA. This can be isolated from the viruses or it can be isolated from the bacteria. Very, very simple. You, anybody can do it in the laboratory. Take the bacteria, boil it, remove the proteins and isolate the DNA. And you get a single strand of DNA, which is this black, okay? This black scaffold. And then what I will do is I can put some small strands in the solution. So these are this green and pink or orange. And what they're called as, they're called as the staple strands. So they can bring different parts of this long strand of DNA into the confined structure and you can make any kind of architecture with this. So let's see a small video where I can show you how this origami works. 
So this black is the viral DNA, a big DNA. And those small threads that you see, the red, green, purple, they're all the staple strands. And this is happening in a test tube inside a small machine called as PCR. And you see that when you heat it and slowly cool it, during those cooling steps, these molecules start to self-assemble. They start to form those Watson and Crick base pairing. And over a period of like six to eight hours, you can get a fully formed 3D or 2D origami tile like this. And using this, people have made different designs. You can make a rectangle, star, smiley shape of the DNA origami. Many, many structures have been assembled. Also, you can now fold the DNA into 3D. So if you see this black is the scaffold virus DNA. And if I program or make my staple strands in such a way that this is complemented to that part and yellow here it is complemented to this part, I can actually fold the DNA origami into any kind of 3D structure which I want. And people have made different designs using those origami structures. Now here is a big advantage that this sequences of the DNA encode the information. And what we are doing is we are translating that information into the structure that we are giving information to the sequences to self-assemble in a very, very specific manner to get any design of my choice. I can make hydrogels, polyhedra, 2D sheet, origami, many, many structures like this. And today we have a full universe or a library of the designs which people can make from the origami right from five nanometers all the way to hundreds of nanometers. Like you can make the objects of 500 to 700 nanometers. And each of those objects have some specific function in biology. So I will go back to some of those functions. But just remember this word, that the hepatitis B virus is 35 nanometers. Please remember this number, because we will need it when we are studying the coronavirus applications of the DNA nano devices. Now let's look at, so this was the structure part, like what we can do with the structures of the DNA. But many times or always when we make structures, you always ask what are they useful for or what can you do with those structures? Are they just fancy structures to look in the AFM or the electron microscope? The answer is definitely no. Like they have some functions. And if you ask a biologist, we can classify broadly the structures into three parts that they can act as the biosensors or the bioimaging agents or as therapeutic agents to cure the diseases. And I will show you one or two examples in each of those uh, categories. So let's look at the biosensors. So this was the first generation biosensor which was developed by Yamuna Krishnan uh, now at Chicago, which was a very, very simple pH sensor that here is a linear uh, DNA. So this DNA ex exists in an open conformation at pH 7 or at a neutral pH. And if you add a drop of acid, the structure changes and it forms a classical eye motive structure. Uh, due to this generality of talk, I will not go in more details. Just uh, understand that this is an open um, uh, open conformation of the switch. And when you add protons, this exists into a closed conformation. And then there are two fluorophores at the ends of those DNA, the green and the red. So when the fluorophore, the, when the machine is open, the, we get a green signal. When the machine closes, we get the red signal. And based on that, you can make a pH sensor. And these pH sensors can map not only pH now, like Yamuna Krishnan's lab has shown different sensors for different ions, free radicals, nitrous oxide species, chloride, and many, many other species, which you can map now in the cells and in the animals. So here is a simple example that you can take a small animal. This is called as C. elegans. It's a very, very so like one millimeter uh, long transparent nematode. And you can inject those machines or those DNA devices into the C. elegans and see on the microscope where do they go, right? And in the first study, what we had found was that they are getting targeted only to some particular cells. Now, these are the cells which attract them, or we call them that these cells express some receptors on which these DNA molecules go and attach, and then they get in endocytosed into those cells. So these are called as the coelomocytes or the liver of the animal. And now you can change the surface of the DNA. I can put some tag, like I can put a brain targeting peptide or a muscle targeting peptide, and then I can change the fate of those devices inside the animal. And what we showed, like this was a work from my colleague Sunana, that these nano machines can be targeted to the animal at a particular site. And you can do in vivo pH imaging in those cells at different time points. And then you can correlate it with the diseases. 
right? So this was one of the simple application using the nano machine, just open and close the color changes and you can map not only pH, but different ions or metabolites in the cells and in the animals. And the second application was the bioimaging uh, applications that you can image some cellular processes uh, in the cells or in the animals. So this brings me to some of my work that if you take again this uh, DNA icosahedron, I showed you how we can make it in a solution. So we call it as a virus or you can call it as an icosahedron. That if you take these two cups, the upper cup and the lower cup and mix them in one is to one ratio, you can form this cage. And what I can do is during this final step, I can put some external agent. This could be gold nanoparticle, this could be magnetic nanoparticle, this could be fluorescent nanoparticle, fluorescent polymer, protein, drugs, antibodies, different kinds of species can be entrapped inside those structures. And you can see some of them on the electron microscope that these are the gold nanoparticles present inside the DNA cage. And what we showed was that they can act as a very, very specific delivery and the bioimaging agents. Let's come back again to the C elegans. If you take a simple drug or a normal drug or a, like a biopolymer, dextran, which is the sh sugar polymer, coated with some fluorophores, a FITC fluorophore. And if you inject the free drug, let's call this dextran as a model drug. You inject the free drug in an animal, you see that it diffuses all over the body of the animal. And now if you take the same concentration or the same amount of the drug, when it is encapsulated inside the DNA cage, you inject it in the animal, you see that there is minimum diffusion in the body and it gets targeted only to those specific cells which express the receptors for this drug and then they get internalized. Now imagine the situation in the cancer. Like what happens in the cancer? That when we give the chemotherapy drugs to the patients, yes, of course, there is a fraction of the drug which reaches the cancer cells and kills it. But what happens is there is a bulk of the drug which diffuses to the other tissues of the body. <coughs> Excuse me, and this causes the damage. You can see the eyebrows going, or the hairs going, or the skin shrink, or the kidneys shrink in the patients. They're exactly the effects or the side effects of those chemotherapy drugs, which you see here that the drug is diffused all over the animal. Imagine you come up with a technology by which you can put those cancer targeting drugs in those, into these DNA cages and tag their surfaces so that these cages are only targeted to the cancer site and release the drug, we can drastically overcome the side effects of those chemotherapy drugs. And these are some of the approaches which we take. So I come back to this part, but how do you functionalize those cages? Or you have to put some tag on those DNA cages so that they are targeted only to the site of the cancer, right? And not to the other cages. And this is something where chemistry comes in. We have done a lot of chemistry by which you can couple not only proteins, but now sugars, small molecules, drugs, peptides on the surfaces of the DNA at a very, very specific site. Using computational modeling, now we can develop atomistic models of those DNA cages. And we know very precisely that which are the positions which are facing outside so that you can tag those proteins or any targeting entities on the surface of those DNA cages and put either the nanoparticles, drug functionalized nanoparticles, fluorescent biopolymers, whatever you want inside those DNA cages and then put them in the animals and see how they're getting targeted. I will show you one simple example of this at this moment. So this is a life cell movie of a cancer cell. So these are the like the SUM cells or the cancer cells. What we are seeing in yellow is one protein which is present inside the cancer cells called as the clathrin. This protein is present everywhere in the cells but we have tagged it with a fluorophore, a yellow color fluorophore and blue are the quantum dots which are functionalized with the protein such that they target these cells and get internalized. Now using advanced microscopy, we can actually map all those events at a single particle resolution. Now this had been one of the very big challenges in the biology that can you see how the molecules are going from outside the cell into the inside of the cell or from the outside the animal inside the cell and our technologies what we are developing using the DNA nanotechnology are now answering some of those questions that here we study the protein dynamics at a single molecule or a single protein resolution in the cell. Hello. Hello. I request everybody to switch off their microphone. Okay. Should I continue? Other than the speaker. Yes. Please switch off your microphone other than the speaker. Can, can I continue? So, so
please do please yeah. do yeah so this is some of the applications in the bio imaging area of devices and now people are developing microscopes well which you can do intra vital imaging or the entire animal to see how we can target the diseases like cancer and other diseases in the live animals using those devices and the last part of the applications is the therapeutics of the dna nano devices and which brings me some of the uh, work which we did and most of the other work has been done in us where what people did was that you can take this dna cages a small dna cage put the drugs on them so these drugs are called as small interfering rna molecules which can inhibit the activity of a protein and then functionalize the surface of those drugs or these cages with a molecule called as folic acid or folate and we all know that folate receptor or a protein which can bind to the folic acid is highly over expressed in the cancer cells and what you can do these days is that you can take a small piece of a tumor from a patient biopsy take a mouse just make a small opening put this tumor in and stitch it back and this tumor will start to develop inside a mouse this is called as xenograft right so i can artificially induce cancer in a mouse and then i can take any of these drugs the free drugs or the dna cages dna cages carrying the drugs and then when we inject them in the mouse what we can do is using advanced imaging techniques you can see that with time all of those dna cages carrying the drug are targeted to the site of the cancer in the animal and we are minimizing the passage or distribution of this drug to the other organs of the body and not only that you can now monitor with time the size of the tumor and people showed that with time the tumor size starts to decrease indicating that not only that these dna cages are targeted to the site of the cancer but they release the drugs at that site and inducing the death of the tumor cells so these are the applications or general application for those dna nano devices <coughs> which we broadly classified into biosensors bioimaging agents therapeutics and what happened is in december roughly 19th december 2019 uh, the first case was diagnosed in wuhan china uh, where the patient had the uh, the infection of the coronavirus a new strain of coronavirus which we and the pandemic has happened in over the entire world now there is no need to describe the pandemic like covid 19 the entire world is undergoing uh, suffering or blockage due to this and still there are a couple of challenges in Uh, uh before scientists to stop the growth or of this pandemic of the corona virus now the two big challenges are uh developing the vaccine against the virus now if we see the vaccines uh, there are two broad uh, classes of the vaccines one are the small molecule like if you see even the drugs which are currently uh, being used with uh, like quote and quote the hydroxychloroquine or um, um, and the rensevir these are some small drugs which have shown some efficacy against the corona virus but they are still to be validated that are these the specific drugs against this corona virus infection or uh, the antibody so that the protein which can bind the virus and stop it from binding to the surface of the cells or the other way around that you bind the antibody to the cell surface so that it will block the virus from entering now these are two broad classes of the vaccine but the problem is they are still under the human trials and the results will take some time the question is can we do something during those times can we come up with some uh, application using these artificial dna designs or nano devices to stop the growth of the virus or to like kind of remove the virus from the blood stream or uh, stop the virus from binding to the cells and getting internalized so some of those applications uh, have been started uh, to uh, bear the fruits and these are the results coming from different parts of the world i have taken from the literature and i'll present one story uh, which uses dna nanotechnology to block the virus and degrade it uh, in a solution so that we can have less number of viruses floating in the blood or going to the lungs and thereby bringing some kind of therapeutic angle to uh, the covid-19 right now if you see the virus um, which is a icosahedral shape a small virus roughly the dimensions of 35 nanometers corona virus is big like at this moment we are not having full uh, um, uh, system to encapsulate the corona virus but let's do some model studies with some existing viruses like the hepatitis b virus which is 35 nanometers and we asked the question or the community asked the question that let's say this is a virus you can call it a corona virus or for experiment we did on the other experiment uh, other viruses 
And suppose I come up with a cage or DNA shell, which can first of all trap the virus. And then there are some enzymes which can degrade the virus. Can it now remove some fraction of the viruses floating in the bloodstream or in the lungs and thereby relieving the patient or uh, allowing the patient to sustain for some more time <coughs> by the time some more drugs are available or some more treatments is available in the hospital. Right? So this is one approach which people have taken using DNA nanotechnology. Mostly this work is done from Henrik Ditt's lab uh, in Munich, uh, Germany. Uh, and we have some complementary ideas to implement in India soon. So let's look back at the DNA origami. Now this DNA origami, which I'm showing you here, is absolutely inspired by virus. Now, if you see virus, how does the virus evolve in nature? It has only three proteins which can form a trimer like this. And this trimer can polymerize into the icosahedral geometry. This is the icosahedral geometry which most of the viruses exhibit in the nature. And what we did or Henrik Ditt's lab did is that they exactly replicated this geometry or um, of the viral self-assembly using DNA. And they could self-assemble different buckyballs or icosahedra of different complexities using DNA origami. And this is a buckyball. Let's see how does it looks like in the cryo-electron microscope. So this is a buckyball shape where you can see uh, the full shape cage, which is developed uh, using the DNA origami. And what they have done is they have used similar approach as we did, that they can make two cups of the, ball, uh, the buckyball. And these two cups can self-assemble to form the full buckyball. Right? So look at this cup, which has a cavity of around 150 nanometers. And what we can do is we can easily visualize that if you have a virus of 30 to 35 nanometers that can very well fit inside this cavity. And then you put other cage, other half of the cage to block it or trap it. Right? And that's what exactly they did. So first of all, the question is, why will the virus come and sit inside this DNA cage? So you have to make it a little bit attractive. So we know some of the uh, antibodies or some of the proteins which are expressed on the viral surface. So suppose I take those classical antibodies, which recognize the proteins on the viral surface and functionalize it with a single strand of the DNA. Okay, this is a DNA tag. Now, if I take this origami and mix this antibody, they will go and attach from the inner side on those DNA surface. So I have coated my antibody with, uh, sorry, I have coated my DNA origami with the antibody. Now this becomes virophilic. That if I put viruses inside this uh, in a test tube, naturally these viruses will come and stick to those antibodies and they will be getting entrapped inside the DNA cage. These are the first images or first results that if you can see the DNA origami, some of them, they can even trap up to three viruses. Some of them, they can trap two viruses. The efficiencies are not very good, but still there are attempts to trap the virus inside the DNA cage. Now, what to do once you have trapped it? Then you can like just inhibit the activity by protease or break the or unfold the proteins using some chaperones. And those are the kind of uh, techniques which people are developing to stop the activity of the virus. And the first question was that does this system even work? That can it actually stop or remove a fraction of the viruses from the bloodstream if you can trap them in the DNA origami? And here is a small approach that they have made a synthetic mimic of the cell membrane. So if you remember our cells, biological cells, they express the proteins on their surfaces called as receptors and viruses bind to those receptors and then they get internalized into the cells, right? Now we can do it in an exactly synthetic way in the laboratory. I can take a simple glass cover slip or a piece of glass and I can stick those same proteins on the glass cover slips and then the virus can come and bind to it. right? And then once the virus binds, you can use a simple electrochemical approach or a signal by which you can say how many number of viruses have bound to this glass cover slip. right? And now suppose if I put, I do the same experiment in presence of those DNA origami tiles, some of them they will trap the viruses and remove it. And hence you will see that there are less number of viruses which are bound to this uh, cell surface, right? So this is a simple in vitro experiment which uh, the Hendrik Ditt's lab did. And here we are looking on the y-axis is the virus blocking. And when you have no antibody, there is almost like 10 to 20% blocking or you have no DNA origami, there is very minimum uh, blocking and then when you start to increase the concentration of those DNA cages or the ant capture antibodies on the DNA cages, you see that this number increases almost to 80 to 90% the virus blocking percentage, which means 
we can quantitatively remove the virus from the system either it can be lungs or it can be blood or it can be those nozzle uh, trachea kind of those systems right so this dna origami based system seems to work that it can capture the viruses and remove it we can think about in parallel that how to degrade those viruses but at least if you can remove or minimize the number of viruses reaching the lungs you can kind of delay the onset of the disease uh, or those symptoms of those sars right so these are some of the next step in which the community is working that how to in vivo neutralize the capacity of different targets that is the coronavirus 2 and pursue the degradation of trapped viruses that you can do it by the ph by the light by acidification by proteases there are different approaches which people are now working to trap the virus and degrade it in the human bodies so this brings me to the end of my talk like i kind of started with the structures the fancy designs and then the applications and here is one real world application one of the real world applications uh, of the dna origami uh, by which we can like trap the corona virus and remove it from the solution so if i have to summarize my field that the this field has evolved now over the last 25 to 30 years that it started mostly with the designs that you can make different geometries self assembly rules stability and other things and then the field has progressed now in the functionalization of those dna designs that you can couple them to proteins to sugars nanoparticles antibodies and etc and etc and then now we are working uh, the field is working at the interface of the biology and those designs that how do they interface with the cells do they induce any immune response what are the side effects of those dna cages or the uh, the delivery approaches and also these are kind of uh, 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 research which is going on in this field and lately we are now focusing on the biomedical application that can you now make the dna cages which can exclusively target the the cancer tumors or any disease sites inside the animals can you make the devices for the deep tissue engineering sensing and delivery applications and so on and so forth so this is the very very new field i would say like even that was discovered in 1980 bulk of the time went only on the papers designing the designs and rules and all and from 2000 onwards the field has taken a big gear that 2000 on uh, to 2010 to 2015 lot of origami designs came in but now is the era where people are not making structural dna nanotechnology we are making functional dna designs that are these dna cages or molecules which you are making are they functional in the biology can you do something with it and that's now the era of the biomedical applications of the dna devices which is slowly beginning and um, we are also part of the bigger community here at iit gandhinagar and there are a lot of labs all over the world doing this research and fortunately we are also contributing a small bit to it like these are two three examples which i showed you today the dna cages which we are making to see how you can target them to specific locations in the cells or in the animals and can you do the bioimaging like can you see how the proteins are talking to each other how the proteins are trafficking and so on and so forth so with this i will stop here and